tonight. Uh, we have Nancy's going to come and sing for us, and she's got two songs, and we're looking forward to it. So come on up, and then when you're done, Ricky's got to take it home.
going to try something a little different for me tonight. Um, until Aunt Angela asked me last night, it had been about 10 years since I had sang in a gospel group, been in front of people singing, um, even played the piano much. Um, so this was kind of a spur of the moment, but I can't sing that song that I just sang without thinking about what a day that will be. Amen. When my Jesus I shall see. If you know this song, sing it along with me tonight. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see when I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day a glorious day that will be there'll be no sorrow there oh no more burdens to bear no more sickness no pain no more parting over there and forever i will be with the one who died for me what a day glorious day that will be what a day that will be when my jesus i shall see when i look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be and before each one of y'all y'all leave here tonight i hope each and every one of you know in your heart that you will meet jesus Amen. Good job, sister. Enjoyed those songs. Every time I hear that song, What a Day It'll Be, my mind goes back to a gentleman by the name of James Adams. I was pastor of my first church, and Brother James had met Jesus Christ a little bit older in life, didn't know how to read, and had a desire. He met him on the riverbank. He prayed and met Jesus, and he transformed his life. And he wanted to teach God's Word, but he didn't know how to read. And he went back to the same riverbank and began to pray and ask God to help him. And God taught him how to read and was a tremendous Bible teacher for the kingdom of God. And that was his favorite song. If we ever were singing it, a song, he would cry out, Hey, let's sing, what a day that'll be. And he's in a place called heaven right now. Uh, I'll tell you this, one day me and him was riding down the road knocking on doors, trying to grow the church, and we were out visiting. And, 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 and I, I'm just being honest with you as I know how to be today, but men sometimes struggle, and I think women do too. And I said, Brother James, I said, how old is it that when you get to the point that you don't have any more lustful thought about women? He said, son, I'm 82. You'll have to ask somebody older than me. <laughs> So, I'm not 82 yet, so I'm still, God's still working on me, amen? And I'm glad he is, and I hope he's working on you as well. It has been a joy to be here this week with you. You've been very good people to preach to. I, I'll be honest with you, uh, I've preached lots of revivals over the years. And I've been in numerous churches that it felt like when I preached that it hit the back wall and came back to me and what I was saying was falling on deaf ears and 
Uh, I couldn't wait to finish the revival so I could go home. I, I'm being, being honest, there's been some churches that way. But thank God it hadn't been this way. I, I mean, I want to get home to Miss Lisa and see her tonight, and I'm going to be hitting 95, rolling in a little while uh, with my Somalian trailer, but I don't have the boat no more. Will, I'm glad to have Will and Joyce with us, and we were talking, and uh, I, the trailer didn't have lights on it, so I got some lights on it today. Will said, you really don't need them, because once you get on 95, you ain't got to worry about nobody catching you no way. So you, you pray for me on the way home tonight. And by the way, let me throw this in as, as well. If you were like me and Sister Sue, that horn blowing out there didn't bother you because me and Sister Sue didn't know there was a horn blowing out there. But my hearing aids and her, we didn't have a clue. So if you get like us, nothing like that will bother you. But it has been a tremendous joy to be here with you. Y'all are great people. I'm excited about what God's going to do in your church. And I believe if you'll keep the same spirit and same attitude toward a relationship with God and be attentive to his word, and when God speaks to your heart, allow him to deal with you and you do business with him. And I promise you, God will move this church in a great and mighty way. It will be a soul win and salvation station. It'll be an example and a light to this community. And there's no limit to what God can do through you uh, as you will open up and allow him to use you in a mighty way. Again, it, it, it has been a joy. Thank you so much. I appreciate your goodness, the, uh, the offerings that you give, the love you've showed, just your presence and your prayers, and I can tell you've been praying. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you have your Bibles, turn with us to Luke chapter 15. I was going to say a very familiar passage of scripture, but I talked to a gentleman a while back and he said it bothered him. When he first got saved, he would be in a church and the preacher would say, turn to so-and-so, which a familiar passage of scripture, and he said he'd never been in church. And there was no passage of scripture familiar to him. And it made sense because it was that way with me when I got saved. So we're just going to look at Luke chapter 15. That's a story that probably most in here have heard. It's a it's a story that I probably preached no less than probably five different sermons on this passage of Scripture, and this is a different one tonight that I preached only a few months ago on this passage. I want to preach with the Lord being my helper, a message entitled, You Can Run, But You Can't Hide. Any of y'all ever heard that phrase before? Does anybody know where this phrase was coined? It was actually coined by a man by the name of Joe Lewis. He was called the Brown Bomber, professional boxer, back in the 40s. He boxed from professionally from 1937 to 1949. He had 25 consecutive wins as champion. It's, uh, it's a feat that's never been surpassed. Uh, he fought... He had 62, 66 wins total and 52 of them by knockout. He was going to fight a man by the name of Billy Kahn, and early in the 40s he fought Billy Kahn, and Billy Kahn going into the 13th round was winning the fight. He was lighter weight, he was faster than Joe Lewis, and he was bouncing around and tagging him. In the 12th round he actually stunned him. And but the problem was when Billy Kahn stunned him, he got overconfident. And then he started going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and in the 13th round, Joe Lewis knocked him out with his power. Well, after World War II, the rematch took place. And he was being interviewed about it, and it was brought up that how Billy Kahn had won the fight up until the 13th round, and that that was probably what was going to happen this time. And Joe Lewis coined the statement, you can run, but you can't hide. And sure enough, in that fight, he tagged him and took him out as well and uh, retained his championship. So that's where the statement came from. Well, I thought about this passage, and I thought about that statement, and there's a young man in this story. It's called often the prodigal son. Any of you ever heard of the prodigal son? Well, this prodigal son, as I read this passage of Scripture again, and, and it's amazing to me. It ought not to be because it's God's Word, but God's Word is a living Word. 
and you can read it time and time again, and, and God comes and shows you something brand new out of the Word of God. And as I read this passage, God began to speak to my heart about this young man running. But the problem was he was running hard, but he couldn't hide. Maybe you're here tonight and you've been running from God. Maybe God's had a plan for your life. Maybe God's been wanting to do something in your life and you've been running, but I got some news for you tonight. You can run, but you can't hide from the presence and the power of God and the moving of the Holy Ghost of God. And God is on your trail. You can run, you can keep on running, but maybe tonight will be the night you'll give up and surrender and stop running and let God do a mighty work in your life. Let's pray and ask God to bless his word. Father, we love you. And so thankful for your mercy, your grace, and your goodness. God, we thank you for the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit that we felt here this week. God, we thank you for the work that you've done in the hearts of your people. God, I thank you for the decisions that's been made. And I pray that you would encourage and challenge and use this message in a mighty way tonight. God, I pray that you would let it stir and resonate in our hearts in a mighty way. You would help this church not, and myself not only to be hearers but doers of the Word of God. And I ask you to anoint me to proclaim your truth, that you would be glorified. I need your presence. I ask you to bind Satan and don't let him hinder in any way. And God will ask you and praise you and glorify you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. The Bible says, And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said unto his father, Father, give me the portions of good that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there rose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to the citizens of that country, and he sent him into the field to feed the swine, and would have fain had filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he had came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough uh, to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me one of thy hired servants." And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said unto his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this is my son was dead and is alive again and he was lost and is found and they began to be merry. I want to share with you first of all today you can run but you can't hide from the call of the world. Now this is a warning for the child of God today this is a warning for those of you that are saved and washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. This is a warning to those that are redeemed and, and are looking for the coming of the Son of God. I want you to know that you, can't, you can run, but you can't hide from the call of this world. The world system that we live in has a call that draws and woos and tries to hinder and bring us back to what we used to do and make us tries to get us to go back to what we used to do. The Bible says, And the younger of them said unto his father, Father, give me the portions of good that falleth to me. And he divided unto him his living, and not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance on riotous living. Why is it that sin, which is so destructive, so damning, so, uh, destroys so many lives, has such an allure and appeal to us? Now, now, I, I'm probably just preaching to Ricky Evans tonight. Hey, I probably don't have... 
Brother David, I could probably not even preach this message tonight. I probably don't need to preach it here. I'm probably the only one that struggles with the call of the world. Yeah, I know y'all are holier than I am. I know y'all got your little pull chain halos on today. You got them pulled and shanking and, and you just glowing and all and y'all don't have no problems with the flesh. Y'all don't have any problems with the call of the world. It's just me. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and preach it because I struggle with it sometimes and maybe I need it tonight. Maybe y'all don't. But listen, this world we live in, the system that we live in fights against us and it draws and it calls. and, it, and it, I, I mean, it's, it, it's just a natural thing. If it's good, it's bad for you. I mean, Sister Joyce cooked some coconut pies this week about make your tongue beat your brain out, but I know they'll make you gain. So I, I feel like I've grown this week being with Will and Joyce. <laughs> Maybe not spiritually, but physically I have grown. Uh, and listen, it seems like everything that's good is, is actually bad, and, and it's just the way the world is wired. It's just, because, you know why? Because that the God of this world is the devil, according to the Word of God. The Bible says he's the God of this world, and he hates me and you. He wants to destroy us. He wants to tear us down. Listen, you know what he hates? He hates that you're in a church on a Friday night worshiping God. He hates that you've come to revival this week to hear the wonderful Word of God, to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, to become more like Him, to be a witness and a light, to make an impact on this world. You see, when you begin to do that, you're impacting His kingdom, and He hates you for that, and He's going to do everything He can to draw you, pull you. And listen, I, I want to tell you, He knows you probably better than you know yourself. He knows what rings your bell. He knows what gets your attention. He knows what little thing it is he can do and dangle in front of you. Now, thank God that most of us, most of the time, we overcome and we're victorious. But every now and again, all of us struggle with the pull of this world. You can run, but you can't hide from the pull of this world. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24, the Bible says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction of the people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Let me tell you, there's a lot of fun in sin. How do you know, preacher? Because I didn't get saved, I was 24 years old. And I tried just about everything I could this world has to offer. And let me tell you, there's a lot of fun in sin. But the problem is it's just for a season, a very short season. You see, it will bind you, it will hurt you. Listen, the Bible says in first, uh, John chapter 2 and verse 16, For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16 says, This I say unto thee, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, I didn't say you had to fall prey from the call of the world. I'm just telling you, you can run and you can't hide from the call of the world. You don't have to fall to it. You don't have to do what it says, but you are going to be tempted. I, I, I didn't learn this early on. First few months I was saved, man, I, I, I struggled with this. I, I remember talking to my preacher, and uh, the devil will play with your mind. And he'd tell me, ain't no way a prayer you prayed changed your life. Ain't no way that prayer you, prayer you prayed on June the 6th, 1990 took care of all those things you've done. And I would still have thoughts that shouldn't be there. And every now and again, I'd say something I shouldn't. And I talked with my preacher one day, and I said, Preacher, I said, I don't really know if I'm saved. I said, uh, Preacher, I said, I think things that I shouldn't think sometimes. I said, I say things that I shouldn't say sometimes. And preacher, I act in ways I ought not to act sometimes. And I really don't know if I'm saved. He said, let me ask you something, Ricky. He said, before you were saved, did it bother you when you thought those things? I said, no. He said, before you were saved, did it bother you when you said those things? I said, no. I, he said, before you were saved, did it bother you that you acted ways you shouldn't? I said, no. He said, does it bother you now? I said, preacher, it's about to kill me. He said, how much more proof you want you saved? 
Amen? I mean, that was the Holy Spirit living inside of me, letting me know it was wrong for me to do those things and wrong to think those things. You can run, but you can't hide from the pull of this world. It's going to be there on me and you, and it's going to affect us. But thank God the Bible tells us if we'll walk in the Spirit, we don't have to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Listen, that's the reason there's no Bible, no breakfast for Ricky Evans. Let me be honest with you. I can't make it without the Word of God. And let me tell you something tonight. If you don't know, you cannot make it without the Word of God either. What, what if you... We, we don't know anything about this because all of us eat. But, but what if you only had one meal a week? You could probably survive maybe on one or two meals a week. Maybe on a, if you eat a meal on Sunday and you ate a meal on Wednesday, you could probably survive, but you would be malnutrition. You would be weak. You would be acceptable to every disease, everything that came along. You, you, you wouldn't have any strength. You, you would be in a bad way, wouldn't you? Be honest. Well, what if you only come to church on Sunday and you come to church on Wednesday, and a lot don't do that, but what, just say you do come to church on Sunday and Wednesday, and your preacher spoon-feeds you on Sunday, the Word of God, and he spoon-feeds you on Wednesday, the Word of God, and you don't never pick up this book right here, this blessed book. Let me borrow yours a minute, brother. Mine's up there. This blessed book right here, you don't ever pick it up and read it and fill your soul and, and fill yourself with the wonderful Word of God you're going to be malnutrition spiritually and those attacks from the world that's going to come, the pull of this world that you can't hide from, it's going to win. It's going to win. It's going to overcome you and you're going to lose the battle if you don't get into this book on a regular basis. Let me assure you today, there's three things you can do and you will never backslide on God. Three things you can do, you will never backslide on God. Thank God uh, some of Hunter Hodge's family is in here tonight. I see several of them. Last night he was here in revival, and on the way out he talked with me, and he said, Preacher, he said, I want to talk with you in a few minutes. I said, you go out there and wait inside my truck. As soon as I get through shaking hands, I'll be glad to talk with you. And I preached about the boat. I preached about the battle and the bread last night, and the boat being salvation. I got out there, and everybody left, and Hunter started talking with me, and he said, Preacher, he said, I've been in that boat. He said, but I feel like I'm on the outside hanging on to the ladder right now. I said, oh, Hunter, I said, we can fix that right now. All you've got to do is rededicate your life to the Lord, make a fresh start with him right now. And the good news is Hunter prayed with me standing right out there last night to make a fresh start with Jesus. You know what? Hunter was kind of backslid on the Lord. He wasn't where he needed to be. And, and oftentimes in God's house, there's a lot of people who are saved it's just like it. you've been saved and you are saved and, and, and you're in the boat, but you feel like you're hanging out on the outside of the ladder. Either you're saved or you're not, by the way. That's what we teach at Free Will Baptist. Uh, it's, not, it's not up and down. In it. I, I mean, you're saved, but now you can be backsliding, getting away from the Lord. I'll try not to get into doctrine too much, brother, but I want to hit this real quick. I didn't plan to park here, but you can start sliding. Let me say this, if you're not on fire for Jesus, you are backsliding. You not, may not be slid out, but you're sliding. And that's a dangerous place to be. And there's probably not a person in here, I, I know I've been sliding before. You ever been sliding before, brother? Where, where you just wasn't right where you ought to be? Even as a preacher, there's been times I've been sliding. Anybody else ever, here ever been sliding? Come on, be honest tonight. Cut your halo off. Let me tell you how you can get to the point that you'll never do that again. Wouldn't you like to know tonight? Honestly, wouldn't you like to know how for sure that you'll never backslide on God again? Three things you do and you'll never backslide on God again. Read your Bible every day. Spend time in prayer every day. And you be faithful to the house of God and I promise you, you will never backslide on God. Every person I've ever talked to that's, uh, that I've witnessed to and talked with that rededicated their life to the Lord that backslid on God, I ask them this question. You've been reading your Bible like you should? 
Nope. Been praying like you should? Nope. Going to church like you should? Eh, kind of. Let me tell you this. Going to church is the easiest thing to do. All you had to do tonight was just come here. You didn't have to study. You didn't have to prepare. All you had to do was just come here and sit down and say, bless me if you can, preacher. That's all you had to do tonight, just come and show up. Listen, let me tell you, it's work to read your Bible every day. It's work to spend time in prayer every day. So let me tell you this. If you're not faithful to church, I can promise you you haven't been reading your Bible like you should and you haven't been praying like you should because if you're praying and reading like you would, you'll want to come to church and you'll have a desire to come to God's house. But if you will do those three things, you will never backslide on God. You, listen, you can run, but you can't hide from the call of the world, but you don't have to worry about it if you're reading your Bible every day, if you're spending time in prayer and you're faithful to the house of God, you will never backslide on God. Never t Listen, is there anybody here that's ever been in a place they shouldn't have been and backsliding on God that you were reading your Bible every day, you were praying every day, and you were faithful to church like you should? I'd like to meet somebody if there's somebody like that. I've never met anybody like that, Brother David. Everybody I ever talked to always was slack on their Bible reading. I want to ask you a question, and I don't want you to answer out loud. I, I don't want you to raise your hand but I want you to answer in your mind right now. I don't want you to be embarrassed. How many of you read your Bible today? Don't answer out loud. How many of you read your Bible today? Think about it. I, I, listen, if you forget everything else I said this week, remember this, no Bible, no breakfast. It'll be the greatest thing you'll ever do apart from getting saved. No Bible, no breakfast. Best thing I ever done uh, beside getting saved was making that, making that commitment to God that I would not eat before I read my Bible every day. Best thing I ever done. You can run, but you can't hide from the call of the world. Not only that, you can run, but you can't hide from the consequences of sin. Hello, somebody. You can run, but you can't hide from the consequences of sin. Praise God for forgiveness. I, I thank God you can be forgiven but there's still consequences to deal with in spite of your forgiveness. So it's best not to do it to start with because there's always consequences. Listen to what the Bible says in verse 14. And when he had spent all, there rose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And when he went and joined himself to the citizens of that country, they sent him, in, sent him into the field to feed the swine. He would have fain and filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto them. Let me tell you, there's a high cost to pay for low living. That's a sermon I preached years ago at Branch Chapel, high cost to pay for low living. Listen, sin will carry you farther than you want to go. It'll cost you more than you want to pay and keep you longer than you want to stay. Listen, you can be forgiven, but there is a high price to pay for sin. You get involved in sin, you start doing things you shouldn't do. Can you go to God and ask for forgiveness? Yes, you can. His grace is sufficient and His mercy endures forever. Over and over in the Word of God, the Bible says His mercy endures forever. His grace is available. To me, it's available to you, but there's always consequences. Listen, you can go kill somebody and you can ask for forgiveness for it. And you can be forgiven, but guess what? You go into jail. You go into jail. Listen, you can go out and get drunk if you want to and get caught uh, with a DUI or hit somebody and you can ask God to forgive you and God will forgive you, but you're going to lose them license. You can hit somebody and kill them, you're going to spend some time in prison. Can I run this real quick, brother? Some of you say, I can social drink and it's okay. You said the Bible really don't say anything hard against social drinking. You got a King James Bible right there, brother? Turn to Proverbs chapter 27, maybe. Proverbs chapter 23 or 27. This isn't my notes. This is free. won't cost you nothing extra tonight. <laughs> Yours is big enough, friend. I can see that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Proverbs 23, right? Can I borrow it real, one yes, second? What verse are you in? Is that your page? Here. Let me borrow it. Yes, sir. Right there. That's my first Bible. 
Y'all give me just a second. All right. All right, Proverbs 23, verse 29. Proverbs 23 and verse 29. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babblings? Who hath wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, and they that go to sick mix, mix wine. Look not upon the uh, wine when it is red, and it giveth its color in the cup when it moveth itself aright. At last it biteth like a serpent, and it stingeth like an adder. Thy eyes shall behold strange women, thy heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, and he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, thou shalt say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When you shall, uh, when shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Now, according to the Word of God, I believe the Bible's telling us there to stay away from alcohol. It says that uh, who has woe, who has sorrow, those that drink alcohol. He says it'll ha cause you to have redness of eyes. It'll make you babble. What you mean? It'll make you say things you wouldn't normally say. Hello, somebody. Hey, it, it'll make you see strange women. I thought I had a problem with alcohol before I got saved. I found out that the alcohol was just a byproduct of my main problem. And it just gave me the ability to chase wild women. I'll be honest with you. Don't call Lisa and don't tell her. Joyce, I know you her buddy, but don't tell her. That old country song they make a way to, made a long time ago, they made it for me. He liked his women just a little on the trashy side. And I'm just being honest. Back in the day, that was my problem. And you know what? I, I wouldn't go chase them until I got into that alcohol. When I get into that alcohol, it give me some boldness that I shouldn't have. And it make me do stupid. Let me say it again. It make me do stupid, stupid, stupid stuff. The Bible even talked about there that him going and laying down in the sea. It, it going laying on the top of a mass of a ship. It'll make you do stupid stuff. And let me ask you, what is the good that comes out of it? Is there any good comes out of it? Man, I'd have to wake up and see how much money I had left to know how good a time I'd had the night before. <laughs> Couldn't remember. I've had people tell me, you done so-and-so, and I didn't know nothing about it. Stupid! Forrest Gump says, stupid is as stupid does, and I'm telling you, I've done some stupid stuff through alcohol. There's no good in it. You said, I can be a social drinker. You know how every alcoholic started? As a social drinker. And can you tell me that you won't be the one that'll come? I, I understand. I know there's a few people that can social drink and never become alcoholic, but can you promise me that you won't be? Can you promise me that you won't become uh, uh, alcoholic? And by the way, the Free Will Baptist Covenant and the original Free Will Baptist and the state tells us in chapter 2 of the covenant, I think it is, chapter 2 or chapter 3, will abstain from the sanctification, use, and sale of intoxicating beverages. So if you're drinking alcohol and you're a member of this church, you're breaking the covenant, and God takes covenants very seriously. Romans chapter 1 tells us there's a long list of sinners that's not going to make it to heaven, and covenant breakers are in that list. That's free. I know. I, I'm glad it's the last night because y'all might not want to come back tomorrow night. <laughs> but I'm just telling you the truth. How do you know, preacher? Because I've been there and I've done that and it caused my wife to tell me the best, second best thing that ever happened to me to look at me in my eye and tell me she wanted a divorce that she couldn't take it no longer. Thank God Jesus stepped in and saved my soul and saved my marriage. You might not like it, but that's good preaching. <laughs> it's the truth. You see, there's consequences of sin. You see, sin will scar you. It'll physically, emotionally, mentally, financially. I, I'm telling you, you can run, but you cannot hide from the consequences of sin. What you saying, preacher? I'm saying it's best not to get involved in the things that the young man did. This young man, he had it made at home. But the problem was he didn't like the rules of the father. Let me tell you this. 
the rules of his father wasn't to hurt him, they were to help him. And God's commandments and God's rules is not to hurt you and limit you, but to help you, to keep you from some things that damage and destructive in your life. Oh, I, I, I'm telling you, I, I wish I could have a do-over on my early part of my life. And now I do realize that there's some of the things I've done in life that it that they were bad, but God took the bad and turned it into good so I can reach some people that's in the same situation I was in. I understand that God brought good out of a bad situation. But I would much rather have it. I've had people say, man, preacher, you got a great testimony. Let me tell you, I got an awful testimony. I wish I could have, tell you that I had the testimony that at six years old I went to an altar and gave my heart to Jesus. And he saved me from alcohol and he saved me from drugs and I'd never tasted alcohol and I'd never done any drugs and I'd never chased any wild women and I'd never been to a bar and I've lived for Jesus my whole life. I wish I could tell you that. I wish that was my testimony tonight. You see, if, if that was my testimony tonight, I wouldn't have to worry about the first point of this message of the call of the world. Because there are some things I've done as a young man, and I didn't get involved in some of that sin that there's pleasure in for a season. The devil plagues my mind with it even today as a child of God and a servant of God. Some of you know what I'm... I see some of you shaking your head. You know what I'm talking about because you've done those things and the devil still plagues you. You see, you can run, but you can't hide from it. You, can't, you can run, you can't hide from the consequences of sin. I'm forgiven. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm a child of God. I'm a preacher tonight. But I battle with some things that I wouldn't have to battle with if I'd have got saved early on in life. The Bible, and I got Bible to back that up. The Bible says, flee youthful lust. Amen? Amen? Not only that, you can run, but you can't hide from the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And somebody said, hallelujah. Amen. Thank God that you can run, but you can't hide from the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 15, verse 17, the Bible says, when he came to himself. You know what that means? That meant that the Holy Ghost started dealing with him. God will let you run so far, but directly he'll yank your chain. Oh, he'll get a hold of you. He'll begin to deal with you. He'll put the hound of the Holy Ghost on you, and he'll begin to make you so miserable you can't hardly live. I, oh, I, I remember some people I've talked with and witnessed to and told about Jesus. And man, they'd be under so much conviction. I've seen them sit in the pew out there and me preaching and the Holy Ghost being all over them and they're under so much conviction, their knuckles are turning white. They're holding that pew. I'm giving all the call and they're holding pew, that pew. They won't turn it loose because they know if they turn it loose, they're coming. The Holy Spirit's running. The Holy Spirit's grabbing their heart. The Holy Spirit's dealing with them and bringing conviction in their heart. Um, you see, it's not necessarily a desire to do right that we have a problem with. It's the answering the call of the Holy Spirit that we struggle with. As the Holy Spirit calls and draws and woos us, we struggle sometimes with that answer. But I'm glad you can run, but you can't hide from him. He'll keep chasing you. The Bible says in John chapter 14 and verse 6, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he'll teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I said unto you. Listen, I'm glad that the Holy Spirit will run you down. I'm glad that he will begin to deal with your heart. Today, I was working on that old trailer out there and making sure it had lights on it and making sure it was ready to haul back to South Carolina tonight. We was there at Will's shop. And uh, there was a gentleman there by the name of Dale. Ain't his name Dale? It works for Will. He come walking in the shop. And, and all the Will's, and I've been around there enough welded and hanging out. They know me. He said, hey, Preacher Ricky. I said, how you doing? And I didn't know his name. I couldn't remember it. And I said, what's your name? And he said, Dale. And, 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 and I, when I looked at him, I could tell he was under conviction. I hadn't said anything about God. I hadn't talked about the Lord. I hadn't, I hadn't preached to him. But I could tell he was under conviction. And, and, and you can tell, if, if you're sensitive you can, to the Holy Spirit, you can tell that when somebody's under conviction. I said, Dale, 
I said, let me ask you a question. I said, Dale, if you die today, you're 100% sure you'd go to heaven. He said, I wouldn't go to heaven. I said, wouldn't you like to go to heaven, Dale? He said, I sure would. I said, would you like to ask Jesus right now to save you and come into your heart and be your Lord? He said, I would. Right there standing in the wheel shop today, I held Dale's hand and he prayed and asked Jesus to come into his heart. You know what? He could run, but he couldn't hide from the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Will told me today that a while back they were in the shop talking and they got to talking about Jesus and said Dale reached in his pocket and pulled out a New Testament that somebody had given to him. See, I don't know who planted those seeds. Somebody planted some seeds in his heart at some time. Probably Will and Joyce didn't even know it, but they've been coming by and shining a light, pouring water on it. Maybe Larry's even come by and shined some light on him and poured some water there on those seeds. And listen, it started growing, and I just come by and picked the fruit today. I just come by, I'm, I was just a fruit picker. I, I didn't have nothing to do with it other than just picking it. Yeah, I just happened to be in the right spot at the right, right time. You know why? Because you can run, but you can't hide from the Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit of God was working in his heart and life. Let me tell you, you're here tonight, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or either you're backslid and you're not where you need to be, you're running. Listen, the Holy Spirit has been working on you this week already. And you know it, and you know you need to get right. You know you need salvation. You know you need to rededicate your life to the Lord. You've been running. But let me tell you, you can't hide. You see, I'm going to pray in a few minutes, and I'm going to pray if you don't come tonight, when you go home tonight and you lay your head down on your pillow, you won't be able to sleep. I'm going to pray that you won't be able to eat. I'm praying that the hounds of hell will start showing up at your house. I'm going to pray that the fires of hell will run up your legs. I'm going to pray that every bad thing that can come will start coming your way. You said, preacher, you going to pray for me that way? I sure am. Why? Because I love your soul and I want you to go to a place called heaven. I don't want you to go to hell. I would rather, listen, I had a lady at Branch Chapel get mad with me and quit coming to church. I made this statement one day. I said that cancer is the best thing that ever happened to some people. She got mad and never come back again. I mean, I mean fuming with me. I didn't like me. I can't imagine nobody not liking me. Uh, but I'm talking about didn't like me. Sue, you know who I'm talking about. She didn't like me, got mad with me. But I'm telling you the truth. Cancer is the best thing that ever happened to some people. Let me explain. Because if they would have died with a heart attack instantly, they'd have bust hell wide open and have burned forever. But God was merciful and gave them cancer and it had the opportunity to realize they were dying and they needed Jesus and they needed to get right and they got right with Jesus before they died. The Holy Spirit dealt with them. They could run, but they couldn't hide. I, I, would you agree with me? Cancer is the best thing. Listen, I remember a lady by the name of Nancy Fitton. I thought this was going to be a short message tonight. Honestly, I did. I, I figured the food over there would be short. But I remember a lady by the name of Nancy Fitton. Her and her husband, Ken, moved down from Maine. They were actually staying at Myrtle Beach, and they were going to Florida. They were retired, and they would come down and stay at Myrtle Beach and go to Florida. You know, they were their snowbirds come down south during the winter. Well, they were coming from Myrtle Beach going to Florida, and they happened to come by. It wasn't no happened. It was God. They come by the road that I live on, on 378 and Old Georgetown Road, and they seen a sign that said land for sale. They turned around the road, went down there, and they bought some land a half a mile from my house. So we met them. They bought, bought the land. They put a well, septic tank, put them a mobile home on it, and every winter they'd come down here and stay. We got to know them. And about three or four years they'd come down, and they would come to the house and eat, and we started talking with them. I'd invite them to church. Could you, could you imagine me inviting them to church? But anyway, I'd invite them to church, and uh, they never would come. But one time, one, the, about the third or fourth year they came, we found out that Nancy was sick. She found out she had cancer. And they went back home, and the next year they come down, and she was bad. And she got really bad while she was here, and she was in the hospital. And I went to see Miss Nancy, and I got there, and when I walked in the room, with tears running down her cheek, she looked at me and she said, Ricky, help me understand. She, she was from up north, never heard about the salvation of Jesus Christ, 
never heard about how good God was and that he had sent Jesus. You, you know what, with those tears running down her eyes, you know what had happened? The Holy Spirit had showed up. He was bringing conviction. You can run, but you can't hide. And I, and I began to share Jesus Christ with Miss Nancy. And right there in that room, Miss Nancy prayed and asked Jesus to come into her heart and save her soul. Three days later, Miss Nancy died and went to glory. Oh, but cancer was the best thing that ever happened to Miss Nancy. She would got killed in a car wreck. She would got killed with a heart attack. Sister, she would died and went to hell. You can run, but you can't hide from the Holy Spirit of God. Maybe you're not where you need to be tonight, and he's working in your heart. Listen, tonight is tonight. This is the time to do business with God and make that decision. Last point, and we'll close. You can run, but you can't hide from the compassion of the Heavenly Father. The Bible says in verse 20, But when he was yet a great way off, the Father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto the father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and, and in thee, and no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to the servant, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring forth the, uh, the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was a dead and is alive and lost and found. They began to be merry. You can run, but you can't hide from the love of God. Oh, what a beautiful portrait of God. Oh, this, this young man had done so many things bad, so many things wrong. But the Holy Spirit had dealt with his heart, and he started coming back. And as he started coming back, the Father ran to him. I like that gospel song when, and when he ran, when God ran. Oh, I like that. I wish I could sing. I'd sing it tonight. Oh, I'm telling you, God ran to him and put his arms around him and loved him so much. You see, the problem is sometimes when that person is backslid and they messed up before and they get out, we get kind of like the, the prodigal's brother. Let me tell you this. If the prodigal would have seen his brother on the way home before he saw his dad, he'd have turned around and went back to the hog pen and started eating slop again. So preacher, you, you ser I'm serious. I'm telling you, if the prodigal would have seen his brother before he seen his father, he'd have rather went back and started eating slop. That's like somebody coming in that's been out and they messed up and they made some mistakes and, and, they, and you hadn't seen them in a while and they come up to church and they, they walk in the back door and you say, well, I ain't seen you in a month of Sundays. Boy, that makes them feel real welcome, don't it? That makes them feel open and ready to come into the house of God. I wanted to knock the fire out of a boy at church one day. I'd visited a couple that had been out for a, a year or more. I'd knocked on their door. This was before I was preaching. And I had knocked on their door, not to pin any roses on me, but I'd visited them several times. And, and Brother David, they came back to church one Sunday morning. Man, I was praying for my preacher that he'd, he'd had the fire on him that day and God get a hold of their heart and they'd get right. And... One of the boys in the church was standing at the back door and I seen them and I shook their hand and told them how good it was to see them. And he looked at them with that sarcastic voice and said, and that's exactly what he said, I ain't seen y'all in a month of Sundays. The redneck come in me. <laughs> I'm telling you, I wanted to, I can't even say it. I, 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 I wanted to lay him out. You know what he was acting like? He was acting like that prodigal's brother. You know the story. The prodigal's brother got mad. Got mad that he come back. We ought to be glad that they would come back. And you see, that's the way God is. That portrait of that father going is a portrait of God's love for me and you. Maybe you have messed it up. Maybe you've made some mistakes. Maybe you've done some things wrong. But God loves you. You can run, but you can't hide for it. The Bible says nothing shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And he goes on a long list of things. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Let me, let me step out a little further. If you reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and you die and go to hell, God will still love you. That don't mean you're going to be saved. That don't mean you're going to go to heaven, but God will still love you. 
God, God's love is an everlasting love. It's a perfect love. It's an agape love. We love people because they love us. Y'all love y'all's pastors, don't you? Come on now, y'all love y'all's pastor. He preaches on your sin one Sunday. You might not love him that day. Hello, somebody. He, he rubs you the wrong way. You have surgery and he forgets to call you or come see you. That sorry, no count, worthless pastor. Now he's the sorriest pastor I ever seen. That's what they'll say about you, brother. They might be right. Hey, hey you know how I know they'll say that about you? Because they said that about me. I've had them say, man, I love my preacher. Oh, my preacher's the best preacher in the world. I love my preacher. He preaches the word. He's a good preacher, and I forget to call him. That's sorry, rascal. <laughs> you see, our love changes. I, I'm being honest. Truthfully, most people have to earn our love. But it shouldn't be that way. We should have that agape love that we love regardless. People's good to us, we love them. The Bible says we don't have no reward for loving people who love us. We have a reward when we love people who don't love us. But let, I, I'm doing, driving home a point and trying to close. I'm telling you, God loves you no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how bad you messed up, God loves you. And he sent God the Holy Spirit to convict your heart to let you know he wants you to where you need to be. And he's reaching out with loving arms, and he's saying, just come home. Just come home. Let me love you. Let me restore you. Let me get you where you need to be. Let me wrap my loving arms around you. How long has it been since you felt the love of God? Oh, he wants to love you tonight if you'll only let him. Let's stand together, all heads bowed, all eyes closed. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, God, that you deal with people's heart. And Lord, just maybe in a crowd this size, there's somebody that's backslidden, somebody that's not right where they need to be with you right now. And God, your word has spoken to their heart. And the Holy Spirit's calling them right now. And they want to feel the Father's love. God, in the name of Jesus, I pray you'd give them strength to step out and come and do business with you tonight. Please, Father, in the name of Jesus, work in their heart, work in their life. And God, we're going to praise you. We're going to thank you. God, I thank you for the Holy Spirit we feel in this place tonight. Oh, he's so strong. He's such present in this place tonight. God, as I've spoken on the outside, deal with people's hearts. Call them right now. Work in their life. In the name of Jesus. Would you come? All heads bowed, all eyes closed. God's working in your heart. God's working in your life. Would you come? God, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray you'd help my brother. Oh, God, encourage him and strengthen him as he's crying out to you. God, thank you for the call of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, dear Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Would you come tonight? God's working in your heart. God's calling you to repentance. Listen, you can run, but you can't hide from the call of this world. You can run, and you can't hide from the consequences of sin. And you need to get it behind you. You need to get it under the blood tonight. You need to get where you need to be with Jesus. You, you know what it feels like to feel his presence, to feel his power, to feel his love and arms wrap around you. And it's been a while. Oh, would you come on tonight and start new and afresh with him? Listen, God's working in your heart. He's calling you tonight. Would you come? Would you come do business? Listen, God is doing business with you through the Holy Spirit. Would you come and do business with God? Listen, His Spirit won't always strive with man. You're not guaranteed that He'll call you again. You're not guaranteed that He'll deal with you tomorrow. If He's dealing with you now, you come on. Come on right now and do business with God. Come on right now and let Him work in your heart and life. Would you come? Listen, there's nothing in this world worth hanging on to. Listen, come on right now. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's something else you're struggling with. Get victory over tonight through Jesus. Come and give it to Him. Get the victory right now. Come on. God's dealing with your heart. You know you need to come. You want to come right now. You, you realize you want to feel that power. You want to feel that presence.
powerful message. You know, when God is there, the message of God is powerful. And God was here tonight. And uh, I appreciate you being here. That made, uh, uh, the Bible tells for two or three are gathered in his name. He'll be here in the midst. We know he was in the midst. Uh, if God spoke to your heart tonight, don't let Satan whoosh, it out. A little children's song. Don't let Satan whoosh, it out. Because he's blowing. So you walk out that door, you'll feel the breeze. You'll feel that breeze. And you'll have to cover it up, hide it to keep the wind, take a coat or something. Because the Holy Spirit is going to try to keep you, but Satan's going to try to blow it out. So what do you need to do? Read your Bible. Read your Bible in the morning. Get ready. Don't let it take you. Read your Bible. Pray. And we look forward to seeing you on Sunday.